Good evening. I'd like to call the uh, January 6th school committee meeting to order. Uh, tonight's uh, primarily the, a budget night. Uh, it's the overview. Uh, I call it the uh, listening session. Uh, so we'll hear that. Uh, before we do that, I'll, I would open up for public input uh, for anything not on the agenda. Seeing none. Uh, and is there a uh, motion? There is. Move to approve the consent agenda. Second. Second. Any, yes, Dr. Dr. I'd actually like to pull the minutes from the 19th, please. Okay. Do you want one? Yes. So, um, two reasons. Unless they were changed, I did send them. Um, so, one is that um, in my report, I mentioned how much Rakasa, despite the uh, sorry. Um, despite the change of title for the Reading Coalition Against Substance Abuse, that they're still doing a lot, the same amounts with the schools. And I thought it was important to demarcate that they are still doing the vaping, they are still doing the vaping programs. They are not vaping. The vaping program, <laughs> um, and they're still doing. Um, Sammy Selkin is getting additional certifications, and they're trying to form a student group. And so, I really felt that was important to include in the minutes. So, I actually sent some wording along, um, and I won't give that unless you think I need to, because the other reason I wanted that pulled was that. Even though I realize that our minutes should not be transcripts, I felt that the discussion of the, um, the evaluation vote that we took needed some more detail in it. It's very hard for people to go online every time and that there were things that are mis being miscommunicated online right now that I think would have been clarified had um, they've been aware that we discussed multiple times that there's still an annual review, for instance. And so I felt that some of the questions that were asked at that meeting and answered should at least be noted so that people would go for the correct answers in the video, okay. in the YouTube video. So those were my, um, and I, I actually offered to go back. I know that it's very time consuming to go back and watch the video. So I'm glad to go back and um, rewatch the video and take out to make sure that they're um, accurate excerpts. Yes. So you don't have specific edits right now? Um, no, because I couldn't go back and rewatch it and in time for tonight. I, I can't imagine that I would have any issue with these changes, but I think it might be better if we yeah. saw revised minutes. Yeah. That's, that's what I'm suggesting. Oh, so that's why I'm saying, okay. that's why I that have the, the other wording, but right. it's not worth taking your time for that since there was another reason I was offering to pull those minutes. So we can review the minutes with all the changes next time. And I'm volunteering to help out if that's if it's helpful for me to rewatch. Great, thank you. That's that's good. Uh, so that was the only uh, item on the consent agenda. So we would uh, vote not to right. approve. So. Should we vote not to approve, or should yeah. we vote to table? Uh, not to, to approve. approve. Okay. We'll vote it again. So all those in favor. Those opposed. Okay. <laughs> Wait. You're saying it in the, okay. We're, We're not opposed the initial. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. <laughs> so they're not approved. That was they're confusing. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Darty, we're ready for the. Thank you. So welcome everyone. This is our first of uh, four nights that we will be discussing, deliberating. Um, and eventually the school committee will be taking a vote on the FY21 budget. I'd like to thank uh, everyone that's here tonight. Uh, the, the building principals are here. Uh, we also have our directors. Um, our fine arts uh, department chair is here um, as well. 
I think we also have uh, members of the Finance Committee um, and other citizens. So thank you very much for, for coming this evening. What we would like to do this evening is we would like to walk you through um, some of the parts of the budget. As, as Mr. Robinson says, traditionally what we do is we do presentations and sections. Um, we'll be going into that in a, in a few minutes. Uh, primarily, it's going to be Mrs. Dowd, Mr. Huggins, and myself that will be doing tonight's, the bulk of tonight's presentations. Um, we do have uh, different administrators that oversee uh, pieces of some of these cost centers that are also here this evening if there are any specific questions that we're not, we're not able to answer. So looking at the calendar for, uh, for the, the next month, essentially, tonight, we're going to see an overview of the, of the FY21 budget. I'll be doing that part. Um, Mrs. Dowd will be doing the financial piece, the financial overview. I will be doing the administration cost center. Uh, Mrs. Dowd will be doing the district-wide services. And Mrs. Dowd and Mr. Huggins will be doing school facilities, town core, and, and capital. Uh, in between each of these sections will be uh, the opportunity for you to ask questions. So if you could hold your questions until the end of a section, that would that would be appreciated. Uh, on Thursday the 16th, we'll be doing regular day in special education. Um, on Thursday, January 23rd, there will be a public hearing, uh, which will be posted tomorrow, Linda. Is that correct, I believe, Wednesday or Thursday? Um, we will also be um, answering questions at that point. On the 16th of January, as I sent uh, to the school committee this afternoon, if we have, if you have any specific questions related to the budget, if you could get it to us by the 16th, that gives us a week to answer the questions and collate them um, so that we can uh, present them to the committee on the 23rd. And then on the 27th, the school committee will, will take a vote. Um, we do need some time between the vote and uh, the 31st, which is when we have to submit a budget to the town manager to be able to make any changes necessary so that we can submit the information to the town manager, which is why we need that, that um, date. And so by charter, town charter, the budget has to be the town manager um, by February 1st. Have we established a FinCom date yet? Yes, I, I believe it's in the calendar. I believe that's in the calendar. We, we could check on that, but I think it is the 20, yeah, I think it is February 26th. That sounds right. Yep. Yep. So before I begin uh, <clears throat> linking the, the budget to the, the vision and educational goals of our, uh, of our district, I do want to uh, say that the budget was posted this afternoon on both the website, the blog, and that went out through Facebook and Twitter as well. Um, it was also emailed to all families in the Reading Public Schools. Um, so everyone that is a Reading Public School family should have received um, an email with the budget, and it has been posted for the community on the website and on um, different social media sites. I also want to give a special thank you to um, Gail and her team for putting this budget together. A significant amount of time and effort uh, was, was put into the development of this budget. I think you'll see um, last year's budget book was great, and I think this year's budget book is even more detailed, um, more specific, uh, based on some of the questions that we received last year. Uh, Mrs. Dowd uh, added more material, more information to this year's budget book. So I appreciate the, uh, the extra time and effort that her and her team put into this. So as we, we talk about the FY21 budget and how it connects to our priorities, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go over different aspects of the goals and how this connects to different aspects of the budget. Not everything um, that I do not have everything listed here and how it connects to the budget. There's obviously a baseline of services and programs uh, that happen every single year, but here are some of the different highlights that are connected to some of the priority areas 
So the first one is decreasing the equity gap between the high need students and the general population of students. And you can see this, is, this takes place in a variety of areas, both uh, training um, at the different levels for differentiated instruction, uh, which is in the regular day piece. We have technology replenishment of computers and smart boards. Um, the funding for a dyslexia screener for early elementary students. Currently, Joshua Eaton is piloting that. Um, and we are researching tools for next year. Um, we had additional staffing, which we will get into more detail later, uh, primarily in special education, which will help in this area. We have homeless transportation built into the regular day transportation funding. Um, and we continue to work with the town and police on the anti-bias issues. We do have some grant funding for uh, some of our anti-defamation league training um, that's, that's going on yeah. with students. Other areas, refining and supporting our data systems. Uh, there is a section, there is a segment of funding uh, for data software, which we are already using, called Analytics Platform, which is included to improve the data viewing and analysis. Uh, we're also continuing to use data to inform all of our practices. All of our schools have data teams, which they are using the data to help inform. And then from that, we're working to both develop interventions, but also to develop training to increase teachers' toolkits um, in the classroom. In terms of monitoring student social emotional growth and systems of support, we have ongoing funding in here for open circle training, and we have early release time dedicated to middle school advisory planning. Um, in terms of evaluating and refining the standards-based instructional systems, we have a significant amount of uh, things going on, uh, or planned to be going on in FY21. We're going to be in the second year of the uh, funding cycle for social studies curriculum and training. Uh, we're going to be uh, looking at curriculum materials, curriculum software, and professional development for Algebra 1 and for grades 7 through 12 foreign language. We will start to explore the foreign language piece, but we will be replacing the, the Algebra 1 in, um, in middle school and in high school and then completion of the curriculum guides by December 2020. And this is all happening um, as part of our FY21 budget piece. We also um, have some other goals, um, improving the physical and psychological security of our schools. As you know, we have capital plan items for security implementation. The, we also have uh, items in the capital plan to upgrade and improve school facilities. As you know, the elementary enrollment study and uh, moving forward, what that's going to look like, our town core budget, which you will hear of a presentation tonight. Um, there is definitely funding in there each year to keep our buildings well maintained, and Mr. Huggins and his team do an amazing job uh, with that and having a preventative maintenance plan. And then the last piece, designing a community portrait of the graduate. There's funding in here for the NIAS decennial vote, uh, a decennial visit, I'm sorry, which is going to be in December 2020. And the portrait of graduate design team actually is going to begin meeting uh, January 15th. Um, so we're very excited about that, and that's going to continue into next year. And as you can see, uh, the critical parts of our vision and how this connects to everything that we're doing, and this, this is all interrelated to the, the, the budget process and where we're going as, as a district. So obviously the focus is on the student, and that is the primary reason why the budget is developed and how it's developed. And then from that, you have your curriculum pieces, you have your evidence-based, research-based, instructional practices for all students. We use, obviously, multi-tiered systems of support where everyone gets a tier one strong core curriculum, um, and then depending on need, to tier two to, or tier three. Um, as part of our vision, we're developing common assessments across grade levels. Uh, our regular education and special education staff are working collaboratively and not in silos, <coughs> which is a critical piece that they're talking and planning with each other. We have teacher leaders that are working um, with our administrative team under Chris Kelly. Um, I know today she had a report card meeting that went very, very well. Um, and then our principals and other administrators are instructional leaders. One of the things that we have done over the last several years as part of the hiring process for our administrators, uh, our principals especially, is that they are instructional leaders 
in, in their previous roles, um, either as a principal in another district or assistant principal or as an instructional specialist or curriculum leader. And then finally, the last piece is using data. All of this is connected to how our budget is formed and developed each year. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Mrs. Dowd, and she's going to give a financial picture of the FY21 budget. Part of this is a very high level. We'll start at the top, and then we'll be diving. Sure. You need to move the mic over. Yeah. I do not have an outside <laughs> yeah, I'm talking to the mic. Right. So this first part is that better? And move it a little closer. Marginal. You might want to switch the sides since you're looking at us. It might make it more obvious. <laughs> yeah. See if I don't knock everything yeah. over in the process. <laughs> I can't even blame technology. I had them come tonight. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Julian. <laughs> so the first part that we're going to go through, I'll go through relatively quickly. This is really the high level, that kind of high level snapshot of what the cost centers look like in high level categories. We will be diving deeper into it, but I figured I would start at the high level and kind of set the stage a little bit. So do apologize some of it may get a little redundant because we try to hit the themes throughout um, <clears throat> and it is an eye chart so I'll be testing people later <laughs> so the first chart that we have here is a high-level summary of each of the cost centers and we did go over this on December 19th that there are the five cost centers that the school committee will be voting upon um, so these are the five cost centers. Again, we'll be covering administration, school facilities, and district-wide programs this evening. So we will be diving deeper into those as we go. Um, one item I did want to point out, because I know it does really jump out, even though it's one of the smallest cost centers, is the administrative cost center it does have a 10.2% increase. But what is included in there is the 1.0 FTE that is getting added as a community priority through discussions with the town. So of that increase, 60,000 of that relates to that position. So excluding that, it's about a 4.7% increase I did feel it was an important item to point that out at the beginning because it does sort of jump off the page and again we'll be diving into each one of these in more detail as we go through this is sort of just to set the stage as we build the budget typically what we do is we look at um, all of our known contractual obligations to make sure we are funding all of those so we have gone through and this does include all of the contractual step and in cola increases for all of our represented groups so we uh, we will be entering into the final year of the three-year <coughs> agreement so I will say this it's always a nice to have these numbers known when you're building the budget we have also, um, Dr. Stiles and I worked very closely over the past several months in looking at the current year as well as next year for all of our known out of district tuition as well as transportation expenditures. You'll hear this throughout the presentation. This is known as a specific time on a specific date. And as soon as you change that time, these numbers can change. So this is based upon what we knew at a particular time. We do typically build in some contingencies so that in case there are changes in placements. Um, the other part that can get tricky is we have built in assumed increases for some of the tuitions we have, as we talked about a lot last year and we'll cover when we go through special ed. Those we have seen changes, even though there are the OSD rates that we have. Private schools do have the opportunity to request larger increases. And the great part about it is when they request it and it's approved, it's approved immediately. So it could be in the middle of the year. Some of them, we've seen them retroactive. They've come back multiple times. So we're, there's a lot of assumptions that go into building the special ed side of it. Um, as um, Chris Kelly will talk about as we go through regular day, we have included funding in there for curriculum, for social studies. We also have curriculum materials and software, professional development for algebra two, Algebra 1, wow. 
I skipped right over algebra. <laughs> um, as I was going into grid, the foreign language. I will caution that we have placeholders in there. As we're exploring these items, we do not have definitive curriculum picked out that we are moving forward with. So we have amounts in there that will work within, which is exactly what we did last year when we did the National Geographic. Chris and I worked very closely to look at what we need and then look at the vendors and, and work from there. Um, we also know we do have the dyslexia screener coming up, so we will be working very closely on that. And then also in here is we are in the f next year is the final year of our transportation contract, so next year we will be going out to bid on that, so we are able to predict those numbers because we do have the final rates. So again, the rates have gone up in the fifth and final year. From a personnel standpoint, um, John did speak to some of these. We have had minimal, I would say, increases in this budget compared to some prior years. We do work very closely in central office as well as with all of the building principals to really look at each request as it comes through. And what you'll notice on this slide is the majority of these were actually discussed on December 19th when Jennifer Allard did her update. So a lot of these were added in FY20, but we're showing them again because they were not budgeted in FY20. So we added them to 20, and now they're in next year's budget. So as we go through each cost center, we'll be going more into what these are and what drove the needs for them. The other area that we will be discussing, and I do, I'll start with the bottom of the slide, is one of the areas that we are working on, and we have several meetings set up in early February between myself, um, Dr. Styes, the director of the preschool, the new director of adult and community education. We are all getting together to look at all of our revolving accounts, the fee structure, the expenses, and really sort of doing a bottoms up approach to that. I also have, am reaching out to the town manager and the town accountant as well to review and make sure we have all of the right rules, requirements. Um, it can be tricky because we also want to be very careful that we are looking holistically at all of our programs and not just pinpointing one or two because you can end up in un unforeseen situations if you look at one revolving account and not all of them. So I need to make sure I'm not only looking at the ones you see here, but we also have food services, which is 100% self-supported currently. So any changes we're making could potentially have an impact. And we want to make sure we understand the impact across the district as well as the operating budget for any changes that we make. So that process is going on and will continue over the upcoming months. So I don't foresee us being able to make significant changes to those structures immediately because it is a longer term. But we will be reporting back as we go through each of the revolving funds. But what we do each year is we do revisit what we have, what we know, looking at participation rates, and we do recommend changes each year, sometimes to increase them, sometimes to decrease them. So overall, we are recommending a net increase of $100,000 to the operating budget for some of these offsets. The other part I do caution folks on is this is based upon information we saw from last year and a little bit about what we know for this year. But as you'll see when we get into some of the budgets, um, and I know I do have Tom and Anna here, it's very early in the year for the current year for athletics as well as extracurricular. I did all of the budget and then we started getting the, some of the numbers in and some of the numbers are slightly lower than we had anticipated or they had been historically. So again, this is an estimate and even though we're looking at numbers for next year, it's a little early in the process to say definitively what my gate receipts, what my user participation rates and what my revenues will be from shows. So as we've done in the past, if we have a projection and we it looks like it may change, we do bring that to the committee as soon as we know. <coughs> but I did want to put a slide on that because I know we have been receiving questions on it. So we did want people to know the process that we're going through. There are always items that are not definitively included in the budget at this point. So if there are any significant changes in enrollment, <coughs> we have changes in our English language learner, I can never say that without stumbling, population. Also, if we do have significant changes in the population within special education, it may lead us to have 
changes in our placements as well as changes in staffing needs. So we continue to update the committee minimally on a quarterly basis if we, if we do see any changes. And again, it gets tricky because we're trying to predict what the world will look like 18 months into the future, which is not always easy when you're dealing with individual students with individual needs. So we will continue to track them and similar to the way we did last year, if we see any changes, we will let the committee know or any new risks that come up. <coughs> so typically, historically what we've done in the past is a quick snapshot to show how the total budget is split out. So regular day is the largest at about 57.4%, followed by special education, which is at 33%. These percentages remain relatively consistent year over year. Um, if we do have a year in which we do need to make cuts, typically what will happen is with regular ed being the largest cost center, that does tend to be where some of the shifts do get made, but we're happy this year that is not the case. So the percentages have stayed relatively consistent year over year. And we actually show that in, um, Oh, that's it. This is the changes in each cost center year over year. Sorry, we changed it last year. We had shown the percentages that they had been. Um, so this shows you year over year sort of some of the shifts in the cost centers over time. And like I said, we will be going through each one of these in greater detail as we go through each of the cost centers. This next slide, as we do each cost center, we will be breaking it down into these various categories, but this is how things look overall for the district. Just to give people a little bit of a background on what some of these are, so when we go into the cost centers, you'll have a little bit of familiarity with them. Professional salaries, that is where the salaries of all of our administrators, department directors, teachers, and specialists are. So the bulk of those are contractually driven based upon the um, contracts we have currently with the RTA. The clerical salaries, that is the central office administrative staff, building and department secretaries. Again, that does look like a large increase, but that is where the new 1.0 FTE is for $60,000. So without that increase, it would be about a 2.4%. So just to put it in perspective that that one change has a significant impact. The other salaries, that is support staff, which is primarily the paraprofessionals, custodians, and substitutes make up that line. The contract services, that is when we are outsourcing to third parties. So the largest items in there are legal costs, transportation, as well as our outsourced cleaning contract that we have at Coolidge and the high school. Supplies and materials, that is where the curriculum materials, technology, classroom supplies, and software. And as you'll see when we get into the regular day cost centers, supplies and material and other expenses are where predominantly the building-based budgets reside. Um, the other expenses, the reason that one may look like a large number is that is where the special education tuition resides in that category. So that is the largest piece of that. We also have postage, dues and memberships, professional development, as well as translation services for any students in which we need to translate material. We have both that on the reg ed as well as the special education side. That is the 30,000 foot view. So I'm not sure if Up folks have questions. questions. Yes. Um, this isn't exactly a budget question, but it's a budget driver. Can you remind us, this might be a Miss Kelly question, um, what the three-year plan for social studies curriculum updates is? Is it, um, I know this year eighth grade civics was the big yep. discussion. Can you talk a little bit about? Sure. So this year we co we're concentrating on middle school. Um, so year one, this is technically this budget year is year one. Um, we did make the huge purchase of the National Geographic, which is currently being used in sixth and seventh grade. Um, eighth grade, we did order some materials, but there aren't a lot of materials yet for the civics. So um, we're doing a lot of creating and we're doing a lot of class sets. Uh, we're still working on that. We may be buying more as they emerge. We just didn't want to jump into buying something that was subpar. Um, <clears throat> currently, the high school is starting with ninth grade revisions, so there will be a budget implication with that. 
um, and they are meeting tomorrow, actually, uh, for a, another meeting to really look at the ninth grade curriculum to see how close the new standards are to what we currently do. There will be some shifting. Um, a lot of the uh, U.S. history went into eighth grade, so there's definitely some shifts. Um, and we haven't purchased a lot of high school social studies materials for a while. So we're t looking this, and that probably, you know, right now um, we, we're looking at history nine, 10, and 11, that's what the state calls them. So it, we're gonna try to do it in the next two years, we're calling it a three-year plan. Um, hopefully we'll be buying, we budgeted for this year for nine. Hopefully we'll start looking at 10, um, and then work on 11, so we're kind of, pushing three years into two, hopefully, because we have so many other curriculum needs. Um, elementary is also getting um, started. So Allison um, Stryker is just starting to recruit members. She sent out an email asking for members at the elementary. Um, most of the changes, the biggest changes in elementary social studies are in fifth grade. So we feel like that might be the biggest budgetary driver there. Obviously, you know, reading books with a history theme we can use them in every grade. So we're gonna use the budget as, as far as it'll go. But um, we budgeted a substantial amount for this year. We're still in the process of spending it. Um, we're hoping to have some ideas for next year's budget. Um, it'll, it'll definitely be in installments. But yeah, we're hoping within uh, the 22 budget that we can probably get all of the social study upgrades done by then. Can I ask a quick follow-up because it's on this topic? Um, so you mentioned that you know the areas, particularly Algebra one and foreign language, where you want to update curriculum, but the curriculum hasn't been chosen yet, but you have to put a number in the budget. Can you talk a little bit about the process? How do you estimate the cost of a curriculum when you haven't picked the curriculum yet? So uh, we're currently doing seventh and eighth grade curriculum work, and Heather uh, and her team uh, at the middle school have started to look at vendors and costs, so we kind of did a ballpark projection for Algebra One. The, the current program that we use for Pearson is not being upgraded. So the same issue that we had, uh, and a lot of it comes on, on the heels of Flash going out. Uh, a lot of companies are not um, continuing with their Flash models. So they're using that opportunity to kind of sunset a lot of their programs. Um, we had not anticipated on doing Algebra One right now, but um, the Pearson model, the, the online features are going away. So um, we're using kind of the same guesstimate that we had for a 7-8, uh, which we probably will be recommending vendors and start purchasing in the next month or two. Uh, we have another meeting at the end of January, so we're, we're close. Um, but we're waiting to see what the team really decides. So we went with that. Um, as far as world language, we have not done any curriculum um, renewal in that in a very long time. I don't know how far we'll get into foreign language. Um, the math might come in more and we may only just start peeling back world language. World language is probably gonna be a multi-year investment as well mm -hmm. because when you start at seventh grade, there's a lot of things and we, we do um, three subjects so, um, with that and that. So, uh, so that's pretty much how we do it. We, Heather did a lot of groundwork getting a lot of cost estimates. The seventh, eighth grade materials aren't that much more financially different than Algebra One. A lot of the Algebra One series include geometry too, so we may get some two for one action, um, and then we might be able to look at Algebra Two the following year. I mean, this is a nice time to really look at our, our uh, as I'm sure you've heard, some of our math books are, are pretty out of date. So. Is it, this is kind of a good time for us to do this. So you've done similar kind of purchases in the past, so you're able to make reasonable assumptions that it'll look similar cost-wise. Well, we projected, we have not bought any middle school math materials yet. So we're finishing our pilots, and we, it, they were budgeted in this cycle. Gotcha. So we will be budgeting, but we know, we know approximately how much it's gonna cost by cohort, so yes. Thank you. Dr. Dox. Um, so I'm hearing from you that a lot of the materials Can don't even ex oh, sorry that a lot of the materials don't even exist yet and from going to the conferences that I've gone to one of the priorities that they've said is to make sure that our humanities are into all, all of across our cur curriculum that they're integrated that there's diversity rep represented that there are role models from all different types of people cultures etc and so I'm wondering if you're finding that and able to price that in because I, I 
if we're spending our money now on the different curriculums and the resources for them, I, my question is, are we going to be able to make sure that we invest in the diverse, the so ones that's that definitely give one of the things we've created rubrics when we look at new tools, and that is one of the indicators that's in our rubric is does this show diversity? Does this show project based learning? Does this have uh, current research in the field? One of the things that really intrigued us with the National Geographic is that they, at the beginning of each unit, they have current people in the field. So, like, as they look at Mesopotamia, they have um, not only in the books themselves, but the online feature, they have interviews with architects that are in the field right now doing digs, and you can actually Skype them, and you can like see what they're doing in real time. So that was a lot of what we looked at was not just the diversity piece, which of course is huge, but also we looked at certain criteria, like does it relate to real world problem solving? Does it look like, does it represent all different cultures? Is it a narrow lens? Does it have female inventors or those kind of things? Like these are all the questions that we're asking. And yes, that is absolutely a question in the rubric that we, we've designed. Awesome, and just to follow that up one more, I think I know the answer, mm -hmm. but like when you mentioned the architects, the current day, they're making sure that those yep. people are also representative. Absolutely, that was one of the questions that we had for National Geographic, yep. Thank you. Actually, in that case, they were actually heavily represented with diversity. <laughs> awesome. Yes. Um, you mentioned that in, there's an increase in the offset to athletics and extracurriculars that reflect an increase in user fee participation. And I know you, you gave the caveat that's a projection, but I'm wondering if that's driven more by an increase in actual participation in athletics and extracurriculars or an increase in enrollment or a little bit of both? It's a little bit of both right. as well as we've also seen increases in the last year's show revenue as well as gate receipts that were also take into that revolving account that we utilize as well. So it's really a combination of all of it. This year's numbers on the charts look slightly lower, but we're still a little bit early in the year, so I don't know. But we this is a smaller cohort of classes yep. coming up, so the numbers are slightly off, so the numbers being down makes reflects sense. enrollment yeah okay thanks so that's why I'm it's a little bit complicated to point to one number when you're looking at the offsets yes um, maybe this is a quick clarification for Ms. Dowd I, I think I heard you say that the other expenses line includes out of district tuition for special education mm -hmm. is that and maybe this is me coming new isn't is that accommodated costs and versus this it is, but accommodated costs are put into the school's budget, so the school does have accommodated costs when they meet at finance committee, but because they're earmarked for the schools, they become part of our budget. So they are included within our operating budget, and the school committee votes upon that. That I was aware of, but I didn't think, I, for some reason, I thought it wasn't part of this, and I thought it was more than $5 million in the last most recent update, so I'm a little... But it was 5.7 or something um, like that? Tuition, yeah. is, tuition is included in there. Transportation is not. So transportation That's in contract, is contract services. services. Okay. So it's two different. Okay. Thank you for that You're clarification. Welcome. Dr. Doxter. I assume that we have not heard any more about the update in the funding and that not. covering no. of any transportation yet. No. Of course not. Not yet. No, not yet. Are we? Okay. <laughs> Sure, they'll tell us the day before they want the information from us. <laughs> Anyone else? Okay. So now we're, we're going to move on to um, the uh, first cost center administration. Uh, it is in pages 21 through 26 in your budget book, which you have in front of you, just so that you're aware of where it is in the book. Um, So you can see here that the administration cost center, the smallest cost center, it's 2.5% of the total budget. Some of the, uh, and you can see as, as Mrs. Dowd said, it's a 10.2% increase, but the majority of that increase is the community priority position uh, that we'll go into in a little bit more detail. So in this cost centers, uh, the, the major changes, so you have your cost of living adjustments, for the central office administrators and staff. The, the primary driver in this budget is salary, in this cost center is salary, um, because it is so small. 
Uh, also, we have in here the FTE, the additional FTE for the payroll HR administrative assistant, which is $60,000. Uh, I do want to add, and I'll talk a little bit more detail later, that up until October, uh, the town was um, sharing with us 0.4 of a 1.0 position. And then um, <clears throat> the person that was in that position uh, did leave. And then they, through a reassessment, the, the town realized that because of all of the demands on the, the municipal side with HR activities, that they needed the entire 1.0 position. So we've essentially been down uh, 0.4 FTE uh, since October. Um, there's also a slight increase in Labor Council services, and that, as Mrs. Dowd said, we're going into collective bargaining in FY21 because we're in our final third and final year. And there is an increase of $5,000 uh, in the extended day revolving account offset uh, due to increased administrative support to support that program. <clears throat> so those are the major drivers, and you can see here is, uh, you see by, the, by object, professional salaries, uh, which are your central office administrators, um, and it's increased there. The, the clerical salaries includes the position that we mentioned earlier, the 1.0 uh, community priority. Uh, contract services, the reason for the 8.9% increase there is the, uh, the legal counsel, um, slight increase in legal counsel fees. So for the overall of 10.2%. Uh, In terms of the FTE chart, the position, um, the 1.0 FTE HR payroll administrative assistant, we're actually in the process of hiring right now. So that's why you see a 10.1 um, actual FY20 FTE increase. Um, and then that will carry over into FY21. All other um, positions stay the same. The 4.8 to 5.8 is where that position is located. So this, this cost center funds 10.1 positions. So a little bit about this, the uh, HR payroll administrative assistant position, and there is more detail in the budget book as to all of the different um, pieces that the HR and finance department uh, play in, in, um, in both the payroll piece and the human resource piece. Just as a reminder, payroll, um, human resources and personnel is about 85% of our budget. I think we have over 900 um, employees when you count extended day staff, coaches, food service employees, substitute teachers. That is a lot of processing of um, paperwork over, over time and hiring. So right now we have approximately 1.5 FTE dedicated to that process. Um, and so we're at a point now where we no longer have the, the staffing to be able to stay up with the demand. Um, what this position will do is it will not only restore the 0.4 FTE that was lost in October, but it is going to provide additional assistance for both uh, the Human Resources Department and the Finance Department. And it will also create redundancy. Right now, we do not have redundancy among these two departments. And we're actually seeing that right now because we do have someone on leave and we have a temporary person in and she's doing a great job, but we do not have any redundancy amongst the department in case for some reason someone leaves or um, illness or, or something like that. So. This position is, is critical, um, and it is a community priority, which it is treated as an accommodated cost. So I just want to refer you to pages 21 and 22 for a minute <clears throat> to go over just a little bit more detail of this cost center and some of this is a little bit repetitive, but um, I want to point out some of the, the highlights. On page 22, you see the uh, administrative assistant line item 28.9%, and that is um, the position that I was just referring to, the HR payroll um, administrative assistant. The revolving fund support of 11.1%, that's the $5,000 increase from um, the extended day revolving account that I was mentioning 
earlier. Uh, and the contracted services, you see uh, Labor Council 32 percent increase, um, and that is again because we're entering a collective bargaining year. Dues and memberships are also slightly up. It's about uh, $2,200, which is why you see the 14.9 percent increase. John, what's <coughs> so we'll, at this point we'll take the, questions on this. I'm just trying to refresh my memory in terms of what we term a community priority. Uh, and I guess what's the likelihood that, I mean, I know we need the position, uh, but what's the likelihood that it may, stays as a community priority down the road? I, so it's usually all, it's community all, priorities are for one year. Right. And then they're absorbed into the, um, the budget, depending on. Last year, for example, the positions for our CASA were a community priority because the grant was ending. Right. So now that is in the town budget under the police department. So, okay. I'll, I got to think about that. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes. Completely dumb question. Worth about five hundred dollars in a multi-million dollar budget, yep. but postage is down significantly, and I'm wondering if that's because what was budgeted in FY20 just hasn't been used. Is that the projections are we budgeted a little too much in postage and can back off Which on it? It's down postage. postage. It's down 18 percent. We're talking about eight hundred dollars. It is not a big no amount of money. So normally, that's the line everyone wants me to cut from. <laughs> um, I like seeing expenses go down 18 percent. So what we have done when we've gone Email. through this is we do try to look at the past three to four years historically to see what it has been and not just as I like to say I won't, we, we try not to just budget what was budgeted last year especially for some of those line items where we do tend to see it and I think what has probably been happening is we do try to move any areas in which we can utilize electronic yeah. delivery versus you know Pony Express we are mm -hmm looking at that so I think that is starting we're starting to see some of that as we're doing a lot more <coughs> and it may sound funny I do remember my first year here I paid a courier to deliver the budget books to the school committee members which we now in the age of electronics are, <laughs> we email the book we let you know if you want it we will provide it here so I think we're also looking at ways in which we can just use technology more efficiently and save on some of those items. Better for the planet, too. Save a tree. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So we are going to move into the district-wide programs. And just as a quick reminder, this is comprised of four <coughs> departments. So this is health services, athletic programs, extracurricular, and district-wide networking and technology maintenance so I do want to thank because I know each of these departments leads is here tonight as well so I wanted to thank them for their support so this is again a relatively small grouping of cost centers it is just over two million dollars and there is a overall decrease in this cost center overall that we will go through. That's a combination of timing when various renewals come through as well as um, changes in some of our facilities rentals as well as um, some of the offsets that we have. So similar to all of our other cost centers, this does include <coughs> cost of living adjustments, salary sets, and column increases for the nurses who are part of the RTA contract, so they are part of the teaching contract. Um, the athletic coaches are contractual, so those move along with the contract. Advisory stipends, similarly, those are all outlined in the contracts. The secretaries are also included on the athletic secretary. That also is collective bargaining agreement. I will say sometimes we do have changes in here. If we have coaches or advisors leave that come in at a different step, it can have an impact on here because it is a smaller group than the, the teaching group. But for the most part, we, we do have a lot of continuity of folks, so we can predict it with, with relative certainty. Um, there's also cost of living adjustments for all of the non-represented, which would be the assistant principal for athletics, 
um, the district network manager, the technicians, and the director of nurses. Those are all outside of the union contract, so we have cost of living adjustments for them. And one of the areas is um, even though we have seen contractual increases in the bus rates, one area we did want to point out is last year as part of the budget we did put an increase in the transportation line item related to turf two in case we needed additional busing or temporary lighting. So we have removed that from the current year. So even though the bus rates went up, the transportation line went down mainly because of that one point. I knew people would ask if I remembered to remove that amount this year. A couple of other items that as we are working through, um, we will be presenting the facilities piece. His, we have made a shift in that the field maintenance for turf two in the stadium are now part of the town core budget. So as so, I have reduced some of those amounts out of the field maintenance that are ours because we will not be paying for the maintenance of turf two in the stadium. That will be handled out of the town core budget. So I felt it was appropriate to reflect that. The athletic facility rentals have decreased slightly for a couple of reasons. One, we have been having discussions with the Y and the, the Burbank Ice Arena, and it does appear as of now that our rates will be relatively flat next year, which is always a positive. The other thing we have noticed with some of the, specifically around the swimming, is that our time in the pool has decreased slightly, mainly tied to um, the late start, is that some of the times have shifted, so we have reflected that in here. So there is a slight decrease in that line. Offsetting that is we have had some increases in our software licensing for the Hello Coaching software. We did see a pretty sizable increase this year, but they are sole source. They are kind of the only provider out there, so we had to go along with that. I, if folks have questions, I'll, I'll look to Tom to help out with that one. Um, the other area that is in the book that we have also seen increases are in our Middlesex League annual dues and membership fees have also increased, I would say relatively significantly again, but th there's not a lot of negotiation room on those. We have seen an overall decrease in the network technology software licensing. As we have told the committee in the past, that is very cyclical. It really depends upon when the software renewals and licenses come up. So they tend to be Typically around a three year, there are very few instances in which we can do a five year renewal. We do have town meeting approval for very specific instances that we can go longer than three years. What typically also happens is when we do a significant capital project, usually the first three years are tied up in the capital project and then we're phasing it out. So I have to give Julian like a shout out. He does a very good job managing it also to try to look at our renewal cycles to try to spread them out as much as we can so we don't have huge significant fluctuations in them. But we do have two significant ones this year and next year we're sort of at a little bit of an off cycle. But I would caution I would not expect next year's rate to continue because I think in the next couple of years some of the three year cycles are coming out and we have had significant capital projects over the last couple of years. Um, but we do a great job working with the vendors, state bid list, um, town procurement, so we're very actively working on all of those. And we've been fortunate to get good pricing over the past few years. This is another area where we have looked at the revolving accounts, looking at the ending balances, looking at the amounts of, that have come in, and we are, part of what we had done for this year is we were not sure if late start or anything might have a potential impact, so we had decreased some of the offsets for this year, not knowing what participation rates would be, but they do appear to be holding steady. So at this point, we felt it was appropriate to look at it and to suggest an increase in the offsets in the outlying years. Again, we will take another look at this once we have a full year of numbers. I will say that this year is also the first year we have gone from four shows to three shows. Um, so I do not definitively know what the impact that will be across the board as to what, what the revenue numbers will look like. So again, it's very early in the year to say what a year of changes will really look like. Um, I will say my team and Anna have been working very closely looking at the budgets, the shows.
so we will see what this year looks like for the change that they've made. So we will keep the committee updated on that. This chart shows the summary for each of the district-wide programs. We will go into each one in a little bit more detail, but this is just kind of a quick snapshot. No major changes in them. So the first one that we will go through, and I think I saw Mary. Yep, she's, yep, she's here. Yep. She's hiding in the back. Um, so health services is the first one that we have. So this tends to be a relatively stable cost center. So the professional salaries, again, that is where um, it's pretty much contractual. That's where the nurses' salaries go. And I, people will oftentimes ask me why the percentage change may look different than what if you're looking at a contract would be. It's because I'm comparing budget to budget, and I base the budget on the people physically here today, which are different than the people I budgeted for 18 months ago. So it could be that we had some turnover in the staffing, so we may have brought people in at a lower step than the person who left, so I carried that person forward in the budget, if that makes sense. Um, the clerical, that is .25 of one of the central office administrators who does spend part of her time doing some of the reporting and, and helps out there, so from a DESE standpoint, we allocate a fraction of her salary to that line item. Um, the other salaries, that is where we have substitutes. And I will say, um, we've been working very closely with, with Mary and Dr. Size on the substitutes. We, I am recommending we increase the budget, which is actually based upon looking at current year actuals, as well as an increased need across the district, especially when it comes to helping out when we have various screenings or when we have various field trips or items that are going on that require a nurse for either an IEP or 504 purposes in which we're required to provide nurse coverage. So based upon the increase that we're seeing this year, we're recommending, it always looks like such a large percentage, but it's a $5,000 increase in the substitute line to afford us the coverage for that. Um, and we work very closely. We do get the requests when they come up. And I will say it's been great working with Mary because she gives us the heads up on all of the needs and a very clear rationale so we can understand what it is. And it's helped us to be able to look at the numbers going forward. Um, the other items, we're not really recommending significant changes. Within the other expenses, that is where we do have AED machines that are split between, we have some that are, fall under health services and fund, some that fall under athletics, so we have seen increases in those annual maintenances. One of the things we work very hard on is to actually get the annual maintenance rather than waiting until something happens and then trying to get somebody to come out and look at it. It's just been more cost effective to get on a maintenance plan where they come out, they look at them, they test them. Um, so that's the main changes that are happening in and I take a slightly different approach. I go through all the details now rather than having you flip to the budget book, so hopefully. <laughs> I should have said that at the beginning. And I talk really fast, so please slow me down if I can see Linda over there. Athletics is the next item that we will go through. So this one is showing a slight decrease, which again is mainly related to increase in the revolving account as well as removing the, we had $20,000 in there this year for transportation and temporary lights related to Turf 2 as well as we, next year, we, we got slightly better pricing for some of our athletic rentals this year which is <coughs> carrying into next year as well as the slight decrease in pool time that is flowing through. So for um, each of the line items, there are, so the professional salaries, that is the portion of Ms. Dezea's salary that gets allocated to athletics. So it is one person who gets split amongst many cost centers. Um, the, I think that is the main one in there. The clerical salaries, that is for the athletics secretary. That again is contractual. Within the other salaries, that is where the stipends for the coaches are, but that is also where the offset is reflected as well. So um, the offset's about 366, so clearly we pay our coaches more than $100,000 a year. 
So that is reflected in that line. And the contract services, that is where we have the equipment repairs, field maintenance, the facilities rentals, which the, uh, is the pool and the Burbank Ice Arena are the two largest ones in there, as well as transportation, so the bus fees go through there. As we talked about, facilities maintenance has decreased because that's now budgeted under the town core. We had the decrease in the rentals, and while we did have an, oh, an increase in the rates for transportation, there is a net decrease for Turf 2 coming back online. The supplies and materials, that really is team supplies, athletic trainer supplies. Um, within the other expenses, that is the other item that you see a pretty significant increase. That is where the huddle software as well as the various dues and memberships that we are paying flow through that line item. So those were the two significant increases in there. The extracurricular, this is um, the professional salaries. That is, again, a portion of the assistant principal salaries that go through there as well as the contractual stipends in the offset is also reflected in that line item and that is another instance the other change that we have made this year to align things more accurately to get them in the right place is we have moved the middle school stipends and offset into the extracurricular because that really is what that is putting it in regular day just it's where we put it last year because it was the first time this current year where the offset was. It really truly does belong in more of an extracurricular as opposed to regular day. So the numbers do look a little odd if you look in the detail, but that is why it looks like the offset is a larger change, but it's because I'm moving it from one cost center to another to put it where it truly belongs. So for folks that are looking at, at the detail, um, and again, we do work very closely. Um, Chris, who works with me in central office, and Anna, I know, have been meeting to go over the revolving account, the budgets, to see how we're tracking budget to actual. So we do spend a good amount of time on there. And all the costs directly associated with the shows do go directly against the revolving account themselves. So the set builds, the costumes, those are all supported within the revolving account. What's going through this cost center is some of the extracurricular field trips that they take. The bus transportation goes through here. Um, we do have a genie machine that, for lifts that we do have to repair. So the repair and maintenance does go through this cost center as well. So we have somebody come out on an annual basis to review it. That number can fluctuate depending if they find anything. Um, but we work directly with the facilities department to coordinate all of that. And then we do have some royalties depending on the timing of when they are and when the shows are, may go through the operating budget. So that's where some of the other expenses are. But overall, um, relatively consistent cost center. The last item in here is the technology budget. We have the professional salaries and other salaries. Those are all cost of living adjustments. And the way that Julian Carr's salary works is he is partially funded in here and partially funded within the administration cost center based upon the dual nature of his role as he helps support some of the administrative cost center technology. So we allocate a portion of his salary. And then the other services are his technicians. The, this is where, again, a lot of his items will fluctuate depending upon the timing of the various <coughs> renewals. So within the contract servicing line items, we do have, that's where the network management and support goes. We have our Blackboard notification system is in there. We also have a number, which is where sometimes you'll see it shifts, is we took over the clocks and bells and paging systems that used to be part, as Julian's laughing over there, that used to be part of the town core. So Mr. Huggins gave us the bells and clocks and we gave him turf too. So I'm, I'm not sure who, <laughs> 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 I'm not sure how that one's gonna work out. 
so we did increase the funding for that line item. Um, this is the first year we are taking that over, so again, we'll be monitoring. We built the budget based upon historically what it had done. I will say we are, which you'll see in the capital, we are in the process of upgrading a lot of our phone systems across all of the buildings. So as we're going through that, we're trying to look for any ways we can connect, automate any of those items. Um, but that is partly why you see some of those numbers change in there. And then in the other expenses, that is where we're saying this year we have two significant renewals that are at the end of their three year cycle. So we will be renewing them this year. We do not have as many next year, so that's why you see the decrease in that line on them year over year. And any, we do get asked this quite a bit. We do look at the pricing one year, two year, three year. We do look to get the best pricing we can off of the state, state bid list. Um, we cannot go out longer than three years unless we have town meeting yeah. approval, and those are for very specific items so we can't do a blanket give us three years five years on everything it's, it's very specific right now it's our digital curriculum and if i remember correctly it was one item related to the backup <coughs> tied to the security project are the yeah. only areas in which we can go out longer than three years so we do work very diligently on these to to try to get the best pricing that we can the last slide is the FTE. There have been no changes in FTEs in this in the district wide cost centers. So that is everything I had prepared. If folks had questions, I'm happy. <coughs> Oh, I've already been given questions on a couple of these things, so I'll ask them and we'll go from there. Yep. But um, and maybe this is you, maybe this is maybe this is Ms. Wentland, I'm not really sure. But the change from four to three in terms of number of shows, what's the uh, rationale for that? What happened? Is it because of yeah. Yeah. you know number of kids? Is it because of other costs? Is it what's driving the, the reduction in number of shows? I was going to see if I could throw that to Anna if she doesn't. Can I just ask that you come up to the mic? I'm sorry. <laughs> Not to put you on the spot, but. Okay. Um, that decision was made last spring in conversation with Natalie Cuna, the Drama Club advisor, and I think a few things went into it. The desire to save in costs over the year, and then also just to kind of consolidate the club's energies and activities when they previously had two winter shows going at the same time during that time of year. Um, it's not necessarily a permanent switch, at least to my understanding, um, to see how it goes this year and next, and then um, make a decision going forward from there. Dr. Dunn. So I just want to clarify, this was not a top-down decision. This was a um, drama request for the budget, a drama um, Coral. It was presented to us that they were moving from the four to three to see how that would work out. Yes, we did not ask them to do that. Thank you. Lindy, you would never forgive me if I did that. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. You have to be flexible. Um, we received an email a few weeks ago or a month ago about uniforms for the band. And maybe that was already addressed, and so that could be it. Or maybe there's a question here in terms of, I think it was 1983 that we last bought uniforms for the band, is what I was told. So is there, A, was it addressed already? And B, if not, is there some way we could get revolving fund accounts or something else that would offset that potential cost? So for the band, we do not have sufficient funds within the revolving account for that, so that would be a significant increase in user fee. One thing that there are items that we could look at. I've started to have conversations as part of the budget process with, I feel like the computer's in a weird place with <laughs> Mr. Zaya, that we need to start to think about what is the right way to look at uniform replenishment cycle so that we have a plan in place and come up with a strategy. We do not have those included in here. I believe the rough estimate, which we would have to go out and get quotes on was probably about $40,000. So 
it is an item available for discussion but when I was building up the budget I was also looking holistically across the department with the curriculum needs and other needs and balancing all of that so we have not included that in here yeah, we would the, we would save that <coughs> discussion yep. until uh, the night before night, we, the, the uh, vote or the, or the public forum the, the night of the vote the, the night of the vote yep okay yes Go ahead, I have a quick one um, under the slide with the technology breakdown under supplies and materials it's a big percentage increase but a small dollar amount so I understand that but going back to actual expenses in FY19 it looks like there was a big jump up in supplies and material just two fiscal years ago and I don't remember I should remember Thirty-two thousand. supplies and materials we got rid of a lot of 32, I think we had some one time of yeah. items that we purchased that year. I'm wondering if I might, they might have been, I'd have to check if they were licensing that should have actually That's what it looks like. I mean, it looks below, like. That it should have gone below in the licensing is we had some one time events in there. And I know we had some additional renewals we were able to get completed early is what that one would be. But I can go back and get the detail for that one. Thanks. Yeah, it looks like it was a one-off. I think it something. was. It, it definitely was, from what I remember. I just don't know exactly what it was. I can look it up though. Julian might know. Oh, he, oh does. he does. I think he does know. <laughs> Bring the smart people to the meeting. <laughs> Are you talking about the uh, supplies, non-instructional? Yep. Yeah. Thirty-two. Thirty-two nine eight five. It so seems to was, always be around. Um, the increase for next year was for the conference bridge for. Um, yep, the six to eight. Six to eight, that's right. It's normally six, it stays at six, but we increased it by two. And I think that. I need to see what was in the 32. It might have been, I might have coded a renewal to the wrong line item, so I can go back and look at that. I don't remember what was in that, but I can check. Um, one more question. Uh, first, I appreciate the idea of moving the revolving support from regular day to extracurricular here. It makes a lot of sense. But the absolute change in terms of the budget, it's very hard to see because of that. Do you know that off the top of your head? It went from 30 to 64 here, but what came out of regular day to make the 64? What came work? out of regular day was 24, and then we increased the extracurricular by 10. So that is. I think the 34,000 change was 24 moved and 10 was added. Yes, Mr. Corn. Jeffrey Corn, Ridge Road. I had a couple of comments tying in a few things there. Um, you had mentioned a uh, possible decrease in revenue from um, ticket sales and user fees because of the, the reduction from four to three shows. I assume there would also be a reduction in the expenses since there won't be a stipend for that. Correct. Uh, is there then a stipend built in for next year for four shows or for three shows? It would have been for the three shows. So I would have based it on. So for this year with three shows and next year as well also? Three yes. Shows? Okay. My understanding was that they were going to look at it for two, two years. years and then make an assessment next year for the following year. So I, I certainly remember being at one of these meetings in the previous year where having an extra musical got a lot of um, negative attention because it cost extra to have an extra stipend. And there was a lot of focus on the expenses of drama. As, and I, I feel, I don't, you know, don't speak obviously for, uh, for those people in that department as to whether they felt pressure from the comments at that meeting to reduce expenses. So. You know, maybe it didn't seem top down to you. It sounded like they were requesting, but I, I feel maybe they were responding to some we were cutting the budget. comments that came up here. And in that light, I kind of wanted to look at, if I go back to the, I'm going to look at the FY19 actual expenses and compare that with the students that were involved in the programs in FY18, 19, where we have total students. So I looked at like the actual expenses, FY19 for athletics were 600 and some thousand dollars versus drama or extracurricular, drama and band, were $60,000, or about one-tenth 
the amount of general budget support. So no, note that those numbers are both net of all offsets, right? So that there was 300 and some thousand dollars in offsets for athletics. So a closer total budget of closer to 900,000 or closer to a million proposed for this year, of which some 35 percent was offset. Um, so 1,200 athletes and about um, $600,000 from the general funds versus $60,000 from extracurricular. And if you add up the drama and band, 438. So about a tenth of the funding, but only a third of the students. So I kind of wonder, what, you how do we the make these decisions as athletics. to, you know, athletics gets so much more money, even kind of per student wise. I think one of the, if I may, sorry. I think one of the difference is that for the extracurricular activity, a lot of the expenses go directly to the revolving account. So the set builds, the costumes are not within the operating budget and then offset they're directly to the revolving account. Athletics, we do not have that. The offset that's coming in is to support the cost of the coaches that are going through. So I think there, there's a little bit of a discrepancy because not all of the costs of extracurricular are reflected in the operating account budget. They are within the revolving account. So I'm not sure if that helps. I mean, you know, I just look at the, the total amount that comes out of the general fund at 600,000 versus 60,000, right? And both of those are net of all of the offset amounts. So I, I don't know. I mean, you know, maybe we can, if we, increase the extracurricular maybe we could fund the band uniforms because you know, to increase the use of athletic it. uniforms sometimes come out of is that out of the offset or is that out of the general budget that we do not have there there's a separate discussion on funding the replacement of football uniforms and others that are not included within this operating budget either i think there's only eight thousand dollars yeah this we have eight thousand dollars for uniforms in the athletic budget okay. for the entire athletic program all right. Thank you, Gail. <clears throat> if we are all set, we will move into the school building and core facilities. <laughs> I'm not going to say it's tough yet. <laughs> so what we are going to do is similarly to what we have done in the past, the school building facility and core facilities, while they are two separate areas, part of it is funded and approved through the school department budget, part of it is funded through the town core. They do work together throughout, so we thought it was important for the committee to see both sides of it. And we also do have a capital update in here as well. Thank you. So this first slide just gives everybody an idea what the facilities department mission um, uh, within the town of Reading. Uh, as every, everybody might know, but we manage uh, and maintain 17 uh, buildings within the town, eight school buildings, and nine municipal uh, facilities, just over 1.1 million square feet of space, and our mission is to support uh, the educational and the uh, business that goes on within all those uh, buildings within the town. This just gives everybody a quick idea of what the facilities department structure looks like. Uh, this is the director, myself. We have a senior admin assistant uh, as well as an assistant director who handles the day-to-day -day, uh, maintenance and upkeep of uh, the maintenance uh, gentlemen out in the back, as well as all outside contractors um, and the cleaning contract on the town side. And then on the opposite side is a school facilities manager who manages the 19 FTEs uh, that clean the school buildings, as well as the school um, cleaning contract that takes care of the Reading Memorial High School and uh, one person over at the Coolidge Middle School. So this slide here just gives everybody a quick overview of uh, the makeup of our buildings, the square footage, the year that they were built, and if a renovation has occurred, and what year that happened, totaling the 1.1 million. And again, this slide, this, this right here, we're showing everybody the preventive maintenance program. 
one of the things that we pride ourselves in uh, in facilities is having a, a really robust uh, preventive maintenance program uh, that covers all school and all town buildings um, that we um, that we execute through a computerized maintenance work order system uh, called School Dude, and we monitor and maintain the buildings uh, through that uh, system. So this next slide here is just just to give everybody an idea generally what we are sort of up against as far as the type of equipment and the uh, service intervals. Um, going from rooftop equipment, exhaust fans, boilers, all the way down to exit signs in the buildings. A lot of this, uh, these items are mandated by uh, the um, state of Massachusetts, some of them by manufacturers, warranties, as well as uh, we're mandated by our performance contracting initiative to uh, run a, and execute a formal maintenance plan to be guaranteed our savings um, for work that was done in 2009. So, this keeps us quite busy. So we talk a lot about the technology we use within the facilities department. Um, we do uh, use technology quite heavily. We have it sort of all tied together between the work order management, preventive maintenance program. Um, we track uh, repair expenses on equipment so we can age it and so that we can populate the capital plan so that we know when a piece of equipment is either reaching the end of its useful life um, and for replacement. And we also track our utility costs um, for all three uh, utilities um, and to monitor consumption and to optimize run times on our equipment. So this all ties together into what we do down there every day. Can't see that, but... Um, <laughs> They're very busy. Thank you. So this, this slide just Look shows a comparison between FY18 and FY19. FY18, we completed 2,448 work orders. And in 19, uh, we did 2,849 work orders. The, the, the average is around 2,600 work orders per year. Um, and you can see, like, the biggest one is the Reading Memorial High School that's trailing always out, at, out in the front just because it's the single largest square footage, uh, 375,000 square feet. Um, it doesn't always have any, have any have, it's not always driven by the age of the building. Uh, work orders, some years we have work, more work orders at other buildings than we do at even a newer building. It, it depends on the activity that's going on. and. Um, how things are working in general, but we do track them at each location, who's doing the work, how much we're spending, which vendors are in the, uh, in the system and working, so we know what's getting done. So this next slide right here, if you look at FY18, the amount of outsourced work was lower than 19, and the reason for that is we had one of our maintenance uh, one of our carpenters leave, and as a result, we had to go outsource more of the work. So that was an uptick in how much work we did outsourcing. So that number went up. It's tracking the other way again right now because we are, we're back up to full staffing. We do try to do a lot in-house when we can. So this uh, next slide right here just shows you our consumption uh, in electricity, kilowatt hour per square foot. A lot of these are, again, it, it's at the public safety buildings. Um, you'll notice that um, in the buildings that are used heavily for rentals um, do trend higher, and it's not just always driven by square footage, but it can be driven by that. This slide here, you'll see the Reading Public Library. The electricity consumption is higher than it was in prior years um, because most of this building is uh, electric as opposed to natural gas, and you'll see the flip-flop effect in the next slide. Again, this is natural gas therms per square foot across the board. Um, and again, uh, weather can drive a lot of these numbers because this is a snapshot in time you're looking at, but you can see across the board. You know, as, as I said, Reading Public Library is an example of that when you switch over to that type of system that's in that building. And then this is, ju this is just water consumption by gallons per square feet. Um, some of these numbers that are higher uh, reflect um, irrigation systems that are uh, paid for through the core facilities budget. Um, rentals impact this also, and things like that. 
So this, we, I did talk about the performance contracting initiative that we did in 2009. Um, and this slide here shows the overall save, the guaranteed, um, the annual guaranteed savings with Noresco and how much we exceeded the guaranteed savings, which is down there in the right hand corner. Uh, the long and short of it is, is that the, um, the work we did is paying off and there's been a, a payoff since day one with it. Um, I mentioned that part of the system, the way it works with the performance contracting is that if you, the guaranteed savings is not met across all three utilities, then they, they write the town a check. That's never happened because we've always, we, 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 and, but we have to maintain our equipment and have a preventive maintenance program that's working. So with that being said, you know, the performance contracting does work very well. And we got a lot of equipment replaced that came off the capital plan in terms of mechanical equipment within the town. So this, uh, this slide right here is just going to show you it's an overall increase of 2.8%. This is what you folks will be voting on for the, uh, in one of the upcoming meetings. Uh, the increase is uh, largely due to cost of living adjustments, salary steps um, for uh, union employees and non-union. Um, we also had an elimination of a 0.4 FTE and that work has been, that position has been distributed across um, a couple of people in within the office at the facilities department. And we also did increase the custodial overtime line um, by I believe it was 10, $10,000, um, and that has a lot to do with um, just the amount of people that we have in the department, the number of, vac um, the number of vacation time that these guys have. Um, some shifts we have to completely backfill. When we can, we don't backfill a complete position, but if it's a daytime slot and someone's out, we need to fill that position for, for an eight for an eight, if you will. So, and you can imagine a lot of the people have four and five weeks of vacation times 19 guys it's important that we keep the building staffed. And again, this just shows you across the board uh, where the increases are in professional salaries, um, clerical salaries, um, contract services is up 2.2%, which is, that's the cleaning contract that we have for the, it's a three-year contract that's competitively bid um, that we, have cleaning nighttime cleaning here at the Reading Memorial High School in one position over at the um, at the Coolidge Middle School. Supplies and materials are up slight amount. Other expenses, which is largely um, custodial maintenance <coughs> equipment repair, we have to maintain. We have a fleet of, believe it or not, of <laughs> custodial equipment that um, our facilities manager is diligent to uh, making sure that it's maintained and operating properly because there's quite a bit of it across all the eight buildings with a total increase of 2.8%, which is what you folks will be eventually voting on. Like I mentioned before, we have a total of 18 and a half um, custodians, a district administrator for a total of 19.5 people within the department. So I don't know if it makes sense if folks have questions on, we're gonna go into the sort of capital. Yeah, let's yeah. do this question. Any questions? Yes. So, Joe, first of all, thank you. Um, same, same presentation concept in terms of what was done at the town. It's good to have it reproduced here for people who weren't able to attend. Um, if you go back to, I don't know if you can go back or not, but if you go back to the slide that showed the work order breakdown and the increase there, mm -hmm. um, and you also mentioned that you're starting to see things switch around when it comes to the percentage of out versus in, I'm wondering if you can give us a perspective of was 19 just exceptionally uh, high or are we are we going to expect to see those numbers again and do we know what's driving the work order numbers so high from year to year I mean the average work orders per year I think we've done like since we've been using school dude like 35,000 33 or 35,000 yeah in the system 37,000 work, 37, work orders in the system. Uh, you're going to see a trend up. It will trend up. Not a lot, but I mean, I, I wish I had a kind of a crystal ball to see what's going to break because the way we avoid breakdowns is by maintaining the equipment. But when we maintain a piece of equipment, whether it's a boiler or a rooftop, it, always, most of the time, I should say, 
it produces more work. It, does that make sense? <laughs> while they're while they're preventing doing a PM on something, you know, they'll say, while we're up here, you should think about doing this. So as the buildings get older, yeah, the work will, tr you know, the work orders will trend up. Um, new buildings do don't necessarily mean less work orders. New buildings, in a lot of cases, mean more work because the equipment is more complex and there's a lot more of it to maintain indoor air quality. Um, the lighting systems are very complex. So those buildings have, if you look at a 60-year-old building and then a brand new building, there's just inherently going to be more equipment in the building, mechanical equipment. So that brings the amount of work orders up, if you will, if that makes sense. So what I'm hearing from you is a lot of it's driven by machinery, for lack of a better way to say it. Yep. Um, what I'm wondering is, is how much, do you have a trend analysis of how much of it's driven by other, f other factors? You know, unfortunately, we've heard things like graffiti in the, in the recent past. We obviously have right. the, the recent issue from December that we talked about as well. Yep. How much, do you have a, a way to break that down to say how much of it is I mean, I human break, created versus machine created? I mean, I can break it down. And I, there's, I definitely have the ability to break it down by how much of it's um, by trade. That's very easy to do. It's not hard. Um, in there also is things like deliveries, for instance. You know, if we have to deliver equipment from one building to another to accommodate an event, that's done by facilities. It's done by either the core facilities guys or it's done by the custodial staff. So we track that too. We track deliveries within the buildings, supplies, you know, equipment and supplies going from building to building. So to answer your question, if we needed to produce something like that, we definitely could. Um, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to you and to the others that have worked so hard on these budgets. Um, I heard loud and clear from our town building committee about how the preventative maintenance is working in our town, how even our oldest buildings are doing really well for our students. And that that is what I wanted to punch on, is that when the maintenance, if we don't spend on the maintenance and we shortchange you, then the students are the, going to be the ones that suffer. Because if the heat goes, if something happens in the building, it's our staff and our students that are there that get inconvenienced. And so I want to say thank you. And I don't want to shortchange the, the maintenance, even though you might find other things when you're up there. Mm -hmm. Um, they were probably things that needed to be found before they were a problem for our educators and students. Thank so, you. thank you. A, a big thing, a, and you're absolutely right, I mean, uh, it's being funded properly to do our job is, is super important. Because if we, it, you know, and the town has learned that if you defer <coughs> maintenance on the buildings, then you're going to be in for, a, you know, a huge expense down the road. Um, the people that are making it happen really are the guys that really work in the department. We have four maintenance men that handle a million square feet. And a lot of the other stuff is outsourced um, because we have to outsource like fire alarm controls, uh, uh, large electrical jobs. But the guys that are doing it every day, believe it or not, there's four maintenance men covering 17, billions, 17 um, buildings and a million square feet of space. So those guys are the ones that make it really happen every day including our assistant director and Kevin, our facilities manager, so. Thank you. Um, I was really happy to see some numbers put to the cost savings for the energy performance contracting. It's, that's just such a win for the town, so I'm happy that you highlighted it. I have a question on the water sewer usage. You mentioned that, um, that it might be irrigation systems at some schools, but the Coolidge and Wood End do jump off the page. I know Wood End has irrigation. I can't remember if Coolidge does. It does. Or, Coolidge does have so irrigation. You would, in both instances, you'd say that's the driver? Yep. Okay. Can I ask one? Yeah. What's that? I was going to jump on that one real quick. Um, sorry about no, that, Gene. No. Um, Coolidge in particular, you know, that, that number is rather, rather large. Obviously, it's, it's slightly bigger than Wood End from a physical space perspective, but not much. Mm, it's, it's actually, it's small. 90, 97,000 square feet, uh, Coolidge. Yeah. I'm thinking of it in terms of yes. soccer fields, and I can yeah. fit two, well, two it's, in it's one and two in the other, really. But The driver is the, the irrigation, yeah. but it's also the amount of use that that building gets. Keep in mind that there's a summer program that goes on. That building is in full swing all summer long except for 
a week after the kids get out and then two weeks before the teachers come back. Right. So that is another example of why that building is this high use in there. We have camps in there all summer and programs that run. So I guess where I was going with that, though, is when I've been on that field, it's been very, very wet. It's almost never dry. Um, I don't know if there might be some other issue going on. I think we've heard the town people complaining about water bills overall. So I'm curious to see if there's anything that you always are on top of maintenance. So I'm wondering if there's anything you guys have done to look to see if there might be a leak, if there's anything, and maybe there's a, a rain detection that can not have the sprinklers go off on certain times. Or yep. That seems that's a just it's always wet. That yep. They do have rain sensors on the irrigation system. We pay we pay the bill through the core. The fields are maintained by the town. So, but to answer your other question, um, our utility bills come in quarterly, and if we notice a spike, because we are using something called utility track, um, we go to it and look immediately to see where the, where the problem is. And at Coolidge, I think it was two or three years ago? Yeah, it was two years ago. We had a, a condensate leak, and we were losing makeup water in the, actually, we were losing makeup water in the system because we had a corroded pipe. So we noticed our, our consumption was going through the roof. You, that's an indicator if you look at, you know, just like on your electricity or your own at home, if you look at it, if, how it's trending and if it's trending up, there's definitely a reason for it. So, but we do watch for that stuff. And, I, and I, well, I have a good relationship with DPW. I can mention that to them. Yes. Just one more. Um, you mentioned the um, removal of a point four position for facilities rental and that that work had been kind of spread out and I guess I'm wondering how that is going I'm a little bit nervous that when no one person is responsible for something sometimes nobody's responsible for it so how is it actually working in practice when somebody wants to rent a facility from what from what we're seeing and what I'm sure Gail can chime in is that it's been the duties have been divided up between two two people in our office and um, it seems to be going well. The billing is being done timely, and the, re the receivables are. I think what this also afforded us, you know, I'm a big segregation of duties individual. It gave us the ability to have the rentals and the custodial filling of it on one path, if you will, and then the actual billing and receivable is separate from it. So in discussions we had when we moved to this model, it was actually sort of a really good scenario because it separates the two functions where the person renting is not the person doing the billing or collecting it. So for us, this was a good opportunity to take a look at how we had it structured. So from a control standpoint, I think it worked out well and we put the positions where they should be. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, Joe, first of all, thank you. As always, a great job. Thank you. Um, one thing I'm not seeing on the preventive maintenance programs is our security systems. Is that covered by town? Um, and I know this is a trickier area. So, so we have a outside vendor who handles monitoring of all of our security um, for all the buildings. In other words, nighttime monitoring, if you will, and for fire alarm at specific locations. When we get into the actual implementation of the security measures, we, it's going to take on a, a new, whole new thing. And what I say, but what I mean by that is, we're going to have to have a more robust monitoring service, as well as, and there's money added into the core facilities budget. Um, and I believe it was like fifty thousand uh, dollars for a. It was fifty. We put in fifty thousand dollars for uh, repairing and um, monitoring it. We'll be under warranty with the, you know, once the stuff is put in, probably for, you know, a year, maybe two years on some of the items. Um, but we want to come out of the gate having a, a program in place. So. Yes. Town. No. That's the town. want to do capital so what we wanted to do was give a quick update there are three sections to this we did get a request um, for turf two so we will start out with a quick <coughs> update on turf two so um, everybody probably knows that the original um, 
allocation at town meeting was uh, two million two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars. Um, luckily, the bids came came in favorable at one million seven hundred seventy-six thousand um, to do the project. Um, as of completion of the project, which we're uh, not completely done done, I will say we're in punch list right now. But we've only had $46,000 worth of mostly owner-generated change orders, which is always a good thing on a project. So the total cost came in at $1,822,118. So um, potentially uh, $402,882 returned to free, uh, free cash. So there's still a few things that have to be done. Mostly it's uh, circling around um, planting of new grass, which they ran out of time, as you can imagine. That's not they ran by past their window as well as some other small punch list items left Joe you so. mentioned or Gail mentioned that we got the bells and you got the <laughs> get the maintenance. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, to be serious I remember when turf well the original turf two went in there was it just no one maintained it you're, you're aware of that when they didn't brush it and do all who is that who's doing that now so right now we have us um we have we have a contract in place to handle the stadium and we're going to extend that over to turf two once we're out of the warranty period um we did get equipment with it um to be able to do it ourselves and we're going to probably be doing most of that with the uh, core facilities guys but um the big pms that need to happen is going to be done by an outside vendor and we do have money in our budget to cover that I believe we have fifteen thousand dollars a year that we just, moved over. We can't not. Do that. Yeah, that was why we felt that this. I, I'll I'll speak for poor Julian, who's having fun with the phones and bells and clocks. But we thought that this made sense from a technology standpoint for us to take over this piece, and from a maintenance standpoint to have the town core take over. That way, we will ensure that it is being done. It will be part of preventative maintenance, and we'll have a good program going forward with it. Ask us again in another year. <laughs> <laughs> Once you're out of warranty. Good, good great, great savings. Great job. Yeah. Yeah, we, we were very fortunate. We had a great uh, general contractor that did the project, so yeah. that, did, that helped quite a bit. So, um, can you? This next slide, what we wanted to do, which we typically do, is we usually at this point have the fy20 capital there were some adjustments that were made as part of november town meeting so what we've done is updated this slide to reflect that what we have added at the top is we had the modular classrooms for birch meadow that were approved as part of town meeting and while these are part of the town core capital they are associated with the school so we feel it's very important to keep Obviously, the school committee apprised of them, even though they're not technically directly within our budget, they are within your care, custody, and control. So we just wanted to give a final snapshot because we will be giving updates on these throughout the year. We did get an update today. I believe we are still on target for the modular bids to go out within the next couple of weeks. We're working with the town procurement officer on those to review everything before it goes out, but we are on target with the timeline we had identified and there'll be more updates to come once we actually start getting the information in the other items that are on there on under the HVAC side of the world I think a lot of those were for the HVAC in the head end rooms right so it, we anything that has an asterisk next to it um, like at um, Birch Meadow um, the Coolidge, the Parker, and the Reading Memorial High School was to add in uh, or replace um, the split systems that are within those um, small, some of the buildings have a smaller, what I call a head-end room or just a data closet with no cooling in them. And we're going to be adding more technology into those when we do the um, security upgrades to the buildings. And we want to protect that equipment. We want to replace the aging piece of equipment that's here at the high school in the server room on the other side of the wall there. Um, so it's going to be a busy summer. So we're already in the process because that was approved at November town meeting. A lot of this capital we're planning on getting cleared off the um, off the docket by uh, spring. 
so that we can concentrate on the bigger projects that we're going to be having going on, which is going to be the modular classrooms and hopefully the security project. And then, oh, sorry. Oh, are we waiting or are we? No, go ahead. Um, so the 244 for Coolidge, if I remember right, that's the heating system as well? Yep, if the 244 is, there's $225,000 in there for um, pulling that rear section of the building um, onto its own hot water condensing boiler and coming off the, uh, the um, heat exchanger that we have. And then there's $19,000 to replace the split system that's in the room, in the server room up near the, uh, near the conference room in the library. So that's what the com combination of the two numbers is. Do you have any sort of forecast in terms of what that would mean from the uh, natural gas reduction from the previous slide where Coolidge was like the top number, 0.89 or something like that? You know, ideally, if we were able to convert the entire Coolidge over to condensing boilers and get away, with, get away from steam, we'd see a huge savings in that. Um, I think by taking, there's about around 30,000 square feet of space that are running off of um, that, that converter that we're talking about. So if we go to the condensing boiler setup that we're talking about doing, we will see a, a big savings because if you think of the steam heat, you're actually boiling the water to get, you know, to get heat out of it, more or less. So the condensing boiler will not need to run nearly as hard as those, uh, those two boilers that are in the boiler room down there. So we're just going to pull that rear section off that boiler and put one sm two small condensing boilers in its place. If, you've, if you had a chance, not that you would, but to go into the high school, we took one of the old Cleaver Brooks boilers, which is probably about 25, 30, 25 feet long, and replaced it with uh, three boilers in there that are the size of a large refrigerator each. And that's heating the whole building right now as we speak, just to give you an idea. So the condensing boilers are not only smaller, but they're more efficient. Um, so we'll keep you posted on what the energy savings is. So eventually we're going to probably want to pull the other Cleaver Brooks out here and put another condensing boiler at the high school. And that one gets to the end of its useful life. Nothing like good boiler talk. Yeah, I thought you'd enjoy that. <laughs> Not as exciting in FY21. <laughs> so this is relatively early on for the capital plan. We are in the planning phases, we're working very closely with the town manager, so I will say a lot of these are sort of more placeholder in nature. I, I'll start off quickly with the first time it's a shift between the, the facilities versus the town side, the school mm -hmm. side of it. So we receive $100,000 a year in capital to do technology infrastructure updates, so I work very closely with Julian and his team to go through the various items. Um, we usually wait a little bit longer to make sure we kind of know what the funding is going to be to decide what the next items are. We're also in the process of a replacement cycle for our phone systems, which are very old and antiquated. So each year, I think we've had, we'll have five years of funding for replacing the phone system. So we're working diligently through that, looking at the older ones, which ones need to be replaced and getting it all on a consistent technology. I think we did Wood End last year, Birch Meadow targeted for this year, Barrows for next year. Who oh, got that correctly? So Julian works very closely with the principals and this is allowing us to have consistent dialing, looking at our voicemail. So it, it's a pretty intricate project, but we are cycling through each of the schools to get it all on consistent technology. The other couple of items that are on there are placeholders for now, a couple of the items that we are looking into as we have been increasing our technology, whether it be via the smart boards or other items, and as we're going into each of the schools, we are noticing that some of the wiring, depending on the age of the building, when construction was done, may or may not be consistent throughout all of them. I'll, I'll say this wrong, Julian will clearly correct me, whether it's CAT five versus cat six um, and it does make a difference with the bandwidth we, we talked about a fun discussion that was right up there with the boilers when we had <laughs> us all around the table talking about cat five versus cat six cabling in the building so one of the items we are looking into is whether it would make sense to have somebody come out and help us do an overall audit and analysis of the buildings of the cabling 
typically what we'll do is we'll try to make sure we really get a good footprint of it before we start to tear through the walls and replace them. Um, so right now, those two items there are placeholders. We're working with the town manager to refine that. So whether or not they'll end up coming off or staying on, we'll know more in the upcoming months as we're starting to work through it now, especially with a couple of the other technology projects. And then there are a couple of next year, 50,000 for the schools, but again, a lot of the items had been moved forward this year in the capital plan, so. But at this time, this won't be an official vote because again, this number is subject to change, but we do want to keep the committee apprised, and I think this goes towards what we've said about the long-term planning for all aspects of the, of the buildings, is this is part of the process as we spend a lot of time on the capital side as well as the operating side. Yes. You may or may not be able to answer this completely or even at all yet, so punch me if you need I'm to. I'm going to go option C. Um, <laughs> is any of the wiring or any of the stuff that's going on or planned for, is it drawing down from the $4.5 million for security, or is that separate and distinct altogether? Separate and distinct. And are they aligned in terms of we're going to put wiring in that might be supportive right. of? Right. The wiring that's in there now is specifically related to the smart boards and other items that are school-centric focused that are not tied to any other projects. So it's the various, I'll say, I don't know if I'll say this, the various drops that are in the classrooms and whatnot for the school-focused technology is what that's geared towards. Dr. Doc. You beat me. That was a question I was going to ask. But to follow up on that, so in other words, by doing that CAD 1 and CAD 2 upgrade. CAD 4, CAD 5, CAD 5, and CAD 6. CAD 5, CAD 6. 1 and 2 was like years ago. I wrote down the wrong thing. Um, so that will enable us to use our technology more efficiently. I've heard a lot about problems across the high school, for instance, with getting reception, right? And no? That wouldn't be what this speed. is. Speed. It, it, it's all about speed. speed. This is more bandwidth Speeds and than beads. Okay. Wi-Fi. So separate. Okay. Thank you. Yes. Can you? And I, Carla, I'm really can you go up to the... Because we can't hear. Folks back at home. Carla Nazaro, Redgate Lane. Um, for the owner generated change orders for Turf 2, can you just explain what those were? Um, Some of it was the paving. They were all. Back to you on that. For turf I'm trying to remember exactly. Some of it was the paving. Say that again. The path between. That yeah, we do have them do some additional station. paving work out there to have better access under the bleachers for storage. That was one thing. Um, the uh, the netting, I want to say the netting was another one, and the and the graphics. Can you those? I'd be happy to respond to the superintendent, and then he can send it out. But I know the paving was one of the larger ones yeah. in some of the rock work and some of the, the rock work cleanup work that we did. We had the opportunity to better pave the path that goes to Imagination Station. So while they were doing the rest of it, we added some of that on because it was more cost efficient to do it at that point under the contract because of what they were tearing up and what they were. Jeffrey Carm, Ridge Road. I just had a question, kind of a general principle. We were talking about capital budget. I wonder, is there a, a split town school on capital like there is for the general budget? Or how is that just, I mean, so, I mean, how do we decide how much capital is going to be done on the school side versus the town side out of the sort of guideline of 5% capital from each budget? We work very closely with, I'll, I'll start it with the town manager. So typically, I feel like right when we end the budget, we start having these discussions again. So over the summer, I want to say in the July and August timeframe, Dr. Doherty and I 
um, Joe Huggins, Julian, we all meet and have discussions as to what are the upcoming needs that we have to develop what it is and also at the same time the town managers having discussions with police and fire so it's really a matter of looking at all of the various preventative maintenance and items that are coming up the various needs whether it's the I'll say this wrong support the fire chief the, whether it's the fire trucks right. whether it's radios for the fire and police department so really it's a collaborative item that we go through and look at everything and look at what fits within the various items so it, it's not so much a split it's really looking at the town holistically and what are the needs across the district and making sure everything fits within that rather than saying x amount here and y amount here it's really looking at everything collectively and we we move things around as, as we need to and depending where items fit but I mean, that's probably usually the town manager covers that during the financial forum as to how we come up with those items. So I don't want to overstep and speak to sort of his area. But it, I will say it's a very collaborative um, yeah. approach where we've been very fortunate to have the good discussions we have and get the funding that we need. Yeah, the, <clears throat> there's been years where we've gotten more capital yeah. and yeah. vice yeah. versa. <clears throat> it's, it's really just a, a needs discussion so I just want to add one thing Joe to will correct me so every <coughs> it is July and August but we what we do is we update the plan and we get current pricing um, so that's really what we're doing as well as adding anything new in that we might have found and discussed with the school department for their buildings in the town for that but it's it's updating it's a 10-year plan so we are constantly updating the numbers so the numbers that are in there are real they're not, they're not just, they're not like a placeholder or a plug. Um, and we have, um, for the larger projects, like the roofs, which are the big dollar ones that are, that are coming up, there are roof projects out in the next few years, we have a um, company come out to revise our estimates to make sure that we're correct and that we're on target, so. Thanks, Joe. Thank you. And that, was, that is the end. Yeah. I have a question that's yes. probably, I mean, very much born of ignorance. When we have companies come back to upgrade, update our estimates, do they charge us to do that? Typically, they're um, organizations we're, we're working with are a part or larger projects that we're asking for estimates on. But if it's the roofing consultant that we're using and we know that it's a larger project, and most of it's directionally, so we know what to put in. They're not bidding on it. They're providing estimates of what it could cost. In my mind, I was just wondering whether we're adding to the cost of the ultimate project by paying along the way for updating the estimates. So you answered that. It depends on the complexity of it. I will say if you're looking at something like a turf two, you do pay a, you do pay somebody to come out and help you assess it with the modulars. We did have that. So it depends on the complexity of the capital project. Thank you. Any other questions? No. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we didn't do reports uh, in the beginning. No. So, Dr. Stice, did you have a report? Um, if you don't, that's okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we are just started the TFM. The state is out today, um, and there will be a um, CPAC meeting on the 14th of January, which is before this next, our next meeting. So next Tuesday, if anyone's interested, there will be a CPAC meeting here at 7 o'clock. Maybe just one more meeting. Yeah, we're meeting uh, mm -hmm. a week or no, the next slide said that. Is the next yeah. budget. Six, it's up here now. January oh, we'll 6th. Second. Second. All in favor? Thank you. Thank you.